Tiny Tina's Wonderlands is a spin-off to the Borderlands series, everyone's favorite cell-shaded action RPG first-person shooter that asks the question, is there such a thing as having too many guns? <laughs> Developed by Gearbox Software, it's just been released on every console that can run it, along with Microsoft Windows, and I honestly doubt most people even knew that. In fact, I'd wager this video might serve as a bit of an announcement that this thing even exists in the first place. Which is a bit of a shame, because aside from a campaign that's pretty much by the numbers when it comes to the shooting and the gameplay, it's also got one of the most over-the-top and addictive end game modes in any Borderlands game I think to date. And while it's not quite as big as the main entries in the series, if you're looking for something to sink some time into with a couple of mates, well, you can definitely do a hell of a lot worse. Now at first, I didn't really know why this thing wasn't called Borderlands, but once I started playing, I started to see why that is, and the setting and the premise here has pretty much nothing to do with the main storyline. That's probably going to be a shame for some people, but a bloody relief for others. Anyway, the whole premise is that Tiny Tina and a few of her buddies are playing a tabletop fantasy game. <laughs> where a bunch of adventurers, the player included, have to find and track down the evil dragon lord after he kills Queen Butt Stallion of Brighthoof. Yeah, that was a sentence I just said. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. <laughs> Unlike the other games, you're not picking predetermined characters anymore, though. You're now making your very own hero. I definitely made the right choice. Able to choose from a bunch of different physical attributes and customize the hell out of all of it or just do what I did and keep clicking the randomizer until you end up with the kind of face that only a mother could love. God damn! In fact, I actually laughed so hard at this face the first time I saw it that I got hiccups. And may God have mercy on your soul. Anyway, after that, you're then treated to an incredibly long prologue which serves as a basic tutorial and a bit of a warm-up before you're then thrown into the game proper. My Wonderland! Now, before I get too far into things, I do want to mention too that this video is sponsored by SteelSeries. These guys make really good keyboards, gaming mice, gaming pads, and headsets. Right now, I'm using the Apex 7 keyboard, I've got the Rival 5 mouse, not to mention their huge-ass LED prism cloth. And I'm pretty stoked to be able to offer a discount on all of these products, along with everything else in their catalog. To get that discount, it's really easy, just use the promo code GMAN at checkout and you'll get 12% off your next order. Which is, you know, 12% more than you'd save otherwise. So head on over to stillseries.com to get started and yeah, enjoy the rest of the video. As for the story from this point on, well, it's actually got a bit of a unique way of telling it. Much like the Borderlands 2 DLC, Tiny Tina's Wonderlands is constantly being narrated by Tina. Someone who started out, I thought, as a really interesting character in Borderlands 2, being this odd, quirky little girl, using her sense of humor as a bit of a counter to the crippling PTSD she must have been suffering from, you know, after everyone in her family died horrifically. Now though, she's just kind of there to say these wacky, random things. And whatever backstory or arc she might have had is just completely done away with. All right, one last thing. Bunkers and Badasses is a role-playing game, baby. That means you do not break character voice. Kapisky? Now look, that's nothing against Ashley Birch. I actually think she's a pretty good voice actress, and her range is actually really impressive. It's just I never found this character to be all that funny, and this campaign didn't really change my mind on that either. Mm -hmm. Tasty. Still though, it is kind of fun having her chime in during missions, and at times she'll even modify what's happening to the player in real time, with elements appearing in the game well to match up with the narration. Uh, fine! Then there's one in a chest right in front of you! Just a clever way of integrating her Dungeon Master persona into the game, and the fact they've done this for the entire campaign, well, it's impressive stuff. There's some really other big name actors working on this thing too. Hearing Will Arnett, Andy Samberg, and Wanda Sykes voicing the main antagonist and the side characters is definitely a vibe. Looking bad! How do we win this? We attack! Together! Though, every single time Will Arnett opens his mouth, I just can't help but picture Job from Arrested Development. Oh, would you... I just made those skeletons! Illusion, Michael. Mm. Trick is something a whore does for money. Overall, the story is a piece of fluff and meant to be taken about as seriously as someone with the Napoleon complex trying to start a bar fight. Any real sense of threat or danger is pretty much completely absent, and it's a consequence-free romp through this magical fantasy land dreamt up in the mind of a quirky teenager. <laughs> It's a pirate quest! Still though, that doesn't mean some of the missions aren't fun and they've really tapped into the whole fantasy element here big time. 
This time, we definitely aren't on Pandora, thank god. I mean, look, I spend enough time living in the desert being an Australian as it is. I think another game set on a barren, empty rock full of convicts would have just been too much to bear. Luckily, this ain't the case. Tiny Tina's Wonderland is a vibrant, colourful world with varying environments and locations for you to tackle all these different quests. Show them no quarter! I actually found some of the best missions in this to be the side stuff, stuff which you might not even experience if you're just steamrolling through the campaign. At one point there's like a whole side quest where you got to help out a group of small red goblins calling themselves Murphs. And they're all being overrun and attacked by blue versions of themselves, who are all infected with a virus that turns them into Zack Snyder-esque running zombies. The person behind this whole thing is the evil Gargle Snot, and he's even gone so far as to kidnap the Murph Fett, the only female Murph in the village. Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. There's another mission later on where you've got to kill skeletons to collect teeth for the so-called Tooth Fairy. Yeah, righto. Who then uses these teeth to create a mimic. Yeah, an RPG staple. Which, of course, you then have to defeat. That's actually a bit of a running theme with the missions here, and you can almost guarantee that if you're helping someone, well, at the end of the mission, they're usually gonna turn on you. Oh, sorry, spoilers. Evil shall bear for me. Apart from that, there's like a whole area that's been destroyed by a giant beanstalk, with the remains of this small town now being held high in the sky, perched on giant leaves and plant stems. Ooh, yeah, Diggy Dog, we got evil plants up in here. <laughs> Some missions even offer up Altman Pass, like being able to seduce various NPCs, or at least trying to. Absolutely. Absolutely not! Plus, there's also the return of Borderlands characters too, in various forms like Brick, Torg, and even Old Mate Claptrap. Still can't decide if I hate this guy or not, but if nothing else, that little wooden sword he's got on his back the entire time, sure, made me inclined to feel the latter. Oh, this isn't working! Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. I think overall the writing's pretty good, and although I often make fun of the dialogue in these games, I hate to admit it, but the game actually made me laugh out loud a fair few times. I can't thank you enough, hero! I love these blueprints with all my heart, and I do mean romantically. A lot of people still talk like they're trying to get upvotes on Reddit, and they still couldn't help themselves and brought back Butt Stallion, which I think is about as funny as a fucking blood clot. But overall, this seems to be like the least obnoxious Borderlands game we've had so far. And I'm just so happy that it doesn't ram pop culture references down your throat every five seconds. Thanks to you! Now, Wonderlands adds a whole bunch of new features into the mix, one of the main ones being the overworld. You see, in between all these main areas where you're completing quests is the overworld. Inspired by tabletop games and also I think Japanese RPGs, this is more or less like an interactive map screen where you can run around, talk to NPCs and get in random combat encounters with groups of enemies. Yeah, it sounds familiar. When this happens, it whisks you away to one of these preset arenas and then starts spawning in waves of enemies for you to pulverize. Once a wave is finished, you get a loot chest and then either return to the overworld or proceed on to the next stage in the encounter. Savvy? <laughs> Wreck them bad guys good, hero! It's a bit of a shame though that there's like a lack of variety to these and they consist of little more than just running around and shooting stuff, but there is benefits to doing this over time, like unlocking shrines in the overworld that give you permanent buffs. Zumios, the patron god of power walking, speeds up your walking speed as you cross the wonder. They're also totally skippable by just punching the enemy that's trying to approach you. It's like they thought of everything here, I mean how considerate. <laughs> I did think initially too that this was going to be like a 6 to 7 hour long game, like it was just going to be some kind of glorified DLC, but I realised pretty quickly when I got to this map screen just how much stuff they packed into this thing. I think exploring the overworld and going off the beaten path to check out all these side areas, well that's going to be easily enough content to keep you going here for 20 to 30 hours for a first time playthrough. And that's before you even get to the end game content. This can't be right. Oh it is. Yeah. The only problem here is the music, or the lack thereof of it, which is a bit of a shame man considering how good the music's been in the previous games. I actually started to think that maybe my game might have been bugged because there were times when I had no music whatsoever, even during boss fights. On the plus side though, this is an amazing looking game. Being able to have that fantasy settings really given these guys carte blanche to create whatever they want and that's what they've done. You'll explore forests, giant fortified cities, the bottom of the ocean, sunken temples, and a necropolis for the final encounter. Even though some of these enemies are very clearly just reskinned enemies from the other games, it's kind of refreshing to not have to fight a gauntlet of gibberish shouting bandits for half the campaign. 
There's also giant sharks, crabs, skeletal mages, trolls, and goblins. And yeah, you get to shoot all of them in the face numerous times. Speaking of fighting, when it comes to the combat and the shooting, I don't think I need to say too much about this. And I feel like anyone who's playing Wonderlands has probably played all the other games in the series and, you know, you know what to expect. Even if you haven't though, you don't really need a degree in shooters to understand how it all works and little yeah. has been done to change that here either. Yeah. So you got pistols, submachine guns, assault rifles, sniper rifles, rocket launchers and shotguns, all with various randomly generated stats and effects. More importantly, elemental effects like lightning, frost, fire and poison. And during combat, you're supposed to match the right element with the right enemy resistance. Enemies with shields, for instance, can be killed quicker with lightning. Fire works best against flesh. And breaking down armors eases with poison. One of the new enemy types in Tiny Tina are the various skeletons. Again, another classic RPG enemy who all have bone health bars, which has a weakness to frost. I think the only real main difference is that shields are now called wards, and instead of second wind, it's now called death save. Yeah, someone really baked their noodle thinking that one up, huh? Overall though, combat's still just a matter of getting a decent roster of weapons, ideally having one for each element, so you're never caught with your chainmail pants down. Absolutely not! Wonderlands has got six different classes to choose from, but it's not really like these classes are going to have any kind of fundamental impact on how you play the game. I mean, you're really just choosing the class that has the most appealing action skill, and pretty much all of these just seem to be pressed this button to do extra damage. It's not like the old games where you'd be dropping out turrets that could deal out DPS and also heal your allies, while holding a single enemy in a stasis bubble in the air for an entire group to wail on. Nothing like that. I guess my point is don't feel like you're signing your life away by choosing one of these classes, because it's not really going to matter all that much in the long run anyway. I've made tougher decisions choosing what colour socks I want to wear for the day. Every single class has access to the same guns, the same shields and the other toys, it's really just the one that appeals to you the most is, I don't know, the one you're going to go with. Fact 2, about halfway through the game you can choose a second class to also invest points in, gaining that class's action skill too I think puts even less of an importance on it. Now I don't think that anyone at this point could truly say they played and understood how every single one of these classes works, in fact I think if you say that you'd be lying through your ass. For the 20 or so hours I played this, I went with the Clawbringer class to begin with, and then later on when I got a second choice, I chose the Spore Warden, only because they're the two classes who both have a companion that can dish out damage and take aggro. And to be honest, I don't even know if I really played them all that well, because this has one of the most confusing UIs I think any Borderlands game has ever had. I mean, fuck man, check out the skill tree screen alone, it's just this mess of different icons and tidbits of information. Among some of the new equipable items are rings and amulets, and look, that's cool, baby. I get it. It's an RPG. We out here wearing that <laughs> fantasy bling, but again, it can be kind of hard to ascertain what this stuff's changing at a glance. Glance, glance, glance. I really feel like people don't criticize the UIs in Borderlands games enough, and this honestly, like I said, feels like the worst it's ever gotten. Still though, I understood the basics of what I could do. The Clawbringer's ability is flinging around a giant hammer, which you can either slam into the ground for fire damage, or throw out to a certain spot to do AoE lightning damage. Apart from that, he's got a pet Wyvern, which deals out elemental damage and flies around constantly, as opposed to the old companions, which worked off a timer and a cooldown. Then once I unlocked that Spore Warden, I got my very own murderous pet Mushroom, who came complete with fully modeled ass cheeks. And he run around punching things and dropping fart clouds. Plus, there was even an upgrade, so this guy could revive me if I got downed. Amazing. Now, having both of these companions running around at once, it was pretty fun to watch. Combined with my various guns and their abilities, it's like I was hitting enemies with the entire periodic chart. Can't I just max out everything? This also gave me access to the rich tapestry of the Spore Warden's abilities. One being an ethereal bow that I could fire out, and more devastatingly, three ice tornadoes which would fly around the area looking for Bill Paxton and doing all kinds of damage in the process. The other new main addition, and what I think is the coolest though, are the melee weapons and the spells. Ready to Unlike the prior games where your melee weapon may as well have been a stale baguette, melee weapons are now equippable and all have various buffs and elemental effects. You got swords, axes, bad dragons and hammers. And at any time you can press that melee button and swing these things out. It's not a huge difference, but it does add another element of strategy to your loadout, plus some of them just look pretty cool. 
The other mechanic are all the spells, and being a fantasy game set in a Dungeons and Dragons setting, well, this new mechanic fits in perfectly. Able to be bound to a single button, and in some cases, they're just absolutely ridiculous. Like, I had one pretty early on where I could summon down a meteor on enemies, and the fact that they were also frost meteors gave it an elemental benefit. It'd be like getting smashed into the ground by a giant snow cone. <laughs> There's spells that cast out from the player, giving you auras that heal or do more damage. Well, there's ones where you can hold them down, clicking your fingers as they cast down in rapid succession. The best one by far, though, was a spell I had to charge up for a couple of seconds, and then I could drop all these lightning bolts on multiple enemies. It was like Zeus himself was yeeting all these motherfuckers from the peak of Mount Olympus. At one point when I was playing with a mate, we both had the same spell, which I can only define as one that launched out fireworks in a bunch of different directions. And when we both cast this at the same time, it covered the screen in so many particle effects that I think I became an epileptic by just looking at it. Now, there are definitely some that are better or worse here than others. Same thing with all the weapons, but I think this is a really undersold and undermarketed mechanic. And they really don't put enough emphasis on just how much fun this can be. You can really do some damage with these, and if you match the elements properly to the right enemy, well, they become really useful, even against bosses. Like all Borderlands games, though, your enjoyment comes at the mercy of the game's RNG, that invisible, number-crunching system that defines whether or not it's going to give you anything worth a damn. The problem I've always had with the Borderlands games is that it kind of seems like you either get a really good gun early on that carries you for hours, or you end up getting diddly squat and your weapons are just like a minor nuisance to an enemy's health bar. Then once you hit around like level 20 or so and have some decent skills to back you up is when you start becoming more effective during combat. But even from that point on, your fun factor is still largely dictated by that RNG. Gosh. Sticking with the whole tabletop theme, Wonderlands also has a really weird approach to how loot drops work. So you're still looking for chests in the game as usual, that doesn't change. But apart from that, you also have to find these hidden lucky dice. Mother. Yeah, the old 20-sided dice, synonymous with long hair, beards, and questionable body odor. <laughs> are these hidden items you have to find throughout every single location in the game, including the overworld. Then with every dice you find, your chance to get better loot increases. And look, I guess that makes sense, but I still don't know how I feel about this. Because not only do you have to seek out the chest to begin with, but also these stupid dice. Most of which are usually pretty well hidden. <laughs> There can often be around 20 or so per area, and look, you're just not going to find all of these without some kind of a walkthrough. But if you don't take the time to find them, well then you're not going to get the best loot, and isn't that the whole point of these games in the first place? RNG's got nothing on you! I played through the game on the so-called intense mode, which I guess is supposed to be hard mode, and the only reason I did that was because it's supposed to increase the rate that loot drops. But even with that, and the ever-increasing stack of lucky dice that I found, I don't know man, I just never found that I was getting anything all that good. Bruh. You wanna know what the worst thing is though? Is when you see a purple item drop, and it's a cosmetic item. I mean, it's annoying enough to begin with that it's the same colour as epic items, and considering how rare those purples seem to be, it's even more stupid. And I just don't really give a shit about how my character looks in an FPS game, where I don't even see my character model for 90% of the time. Even when you do get a rare or an epic weapon, a lot of the time, they're just really not that good. Some of them are what I'd describe as overstyled and underdesigned, and by that, I mean it's obvious someone very talented has put a whole lip of effort into how they look, but then they're often really crappy during combat. Like, you get a new weapon and it does high damage and has a high elemental chance, only it has a magazine size of six bullets, it fires three shots, and then slaps your mum across the face every time you reload. I think the shotguns, rocket launchers, and the sniper rifles are the worst by far. 90% of them shoot out these weird looking projectiles and they have the most bizarre reload animations. Not all of the weapons are bad though, and in some cases I actually like the creativity. With certain weapons, when you reload them, it leaves behind a three-headed Hydra turret, you know, something straight out of Diablo. But I just found that the vast majority of weapons I got here, regardless of their rarity, were just utter shit. It just comes back to what I was saying before, how it often means you'll be sitting on that one decent gun you've gotten until it becomes so underpowered that you're better off using harsh language. 
This is a thing that's been a problem for me with the series for a while now, and it's kind of a shame that Gearbox haven't still managed to find a middle ground between a gun being stupidly overpowered and then so useless that it'd be better off used as a paperweight. The key difference this time though, and I guess a positive aspect, is the inclusion of those spells to fall back on and the melee weapons. But either way, my friends, get ready for some spongy, repetitive combat. Bruh. You've also got to kind of give it to these guys that, you know, here we are like, what, five games deep into the series? And still, the only way to get out of harm's way during combat is to just kind of run away from something. And they added in melee weapons, but there's no block or parry system, despite that being the absolute trend in games recently. I mean, they totally broke ground in Borderlands 3 with a ground slam and a slide move, but it's really kind of hard to praise the controls here when it's still little more than just running, strafing, and jumping. I guess though, if you've got a gun that melts everything in seconds, well then you're not going to be thinking about that stuff. If you're lucky enough to have a few mates to play with, well then it probably won't even matter to begin with. And as you'd expect for a Borderlands game, Wonderlands really does excel in the co-op mode when played with friends. I mean, after all, that's the whole lessons of the game, right? More players equals tougher enemies, which equals better loot and hand jobs for everyone involved. At the end of the day, you're only playing this to get bigger and better guns. That kind of ties into Wonderland's endgame called the Chaos Chamber, which is what I call my toilet the morning after I've eaten a bad batch of beef vindaloo. Oh, Jesus. So instead of actual aids or uh, aids, so instead of actual raids or anything like that, you've got the Chaos Chambers. In the heart of the city of Brighthoof is a portal which leads to these randomly generated, infinitely replayable dungeons you have to clear out. Catch, however, and what I think makes this mode really awesome is you can customize how this experience plays out. You see, at the end of each encounter, you have two options to choose from, of which there's about like four or five in total, one of which can be getting a buff from Butt Stallion or a curse from the Dragon Lord. And these are the important ones to consider because although the curses make the encounters more difficult, on the flip side, this also multiplies how many gems you get from enemies. Gems which can be spent on temporary player upgrades in the middle of the challenge, but more importantly, at the end of the run to buy that sweet, sweet loot. <laughs> At the end of each run, not only do you get a chest, which is usually stocked with purples, but you can then spend your gems on various statues and take your chances on getting a specific item. This is by far the best way to get legendaries at the moment, and I think almost every time I finish one of these chambers, I got at least a couple of legendaries from these statues at the end. I got a submachine gun at one point, for instance, which fired out what looked like the buy rifle blobs from Unreal Tournament, and then when I reloaded, the weapon got thrown out and exploded in a giant pillar of fire. I mean... Fuck. These chambers do start off pretty easy, but they can get super hard quick if you want them to. Like for instance, you can spend gems to make each encounter contain only elite enemies. And there's optional side objectives to make them even more challenging. Idiot. And then aside from that, there's the chaos levels, which can then be increased by completing a specific run. And every chaos level buffs up the enemy health points even higher, but also increasing the XP and the loot gains the player receives. By the time me and my mates had got to Chaos Level 3, things were getting pretty damn intense. And you really had to start pinging certain enemies and focusing your attacks, whereas it did kind of feel like on the other difficulty levels you could get by just willy-nilly. It's just an incredibly simple but addictive loop. And every time I finish one of these chambers, all I really wanted to do was get back in there and do another one. One of the first legendaries I got from this was an assault rifle which shoots out a bunch of saw blades and then combined with all the other crap my mates were firing off and the amount of gems spewing out of enemies when they died, it was just complete visual chaos but in the best way possible. I don't even know what's going on in the tornadoes but I know shit's dying. Yeah. I guess the main issue with these is that they really are just recycling those other arenas from the overworld encounters so it's not exactly new content in that regard. The different conditions of each Chaos Chamber makes them unique, but this endgame isn't going to be anything you haven't seen before. It even reuses the same boss fights from throughout the campaign, which ends up being a bit of a blessing or has you cursing depending on which one you get. Some of the boss fights are just piss easy, whereas the others are super drawn out and can take minutes. MINUTES! You know it's funny because this was like the shortest boss fight we had. But again, that's the whole RNG aspect again, ruin its butt ugly head. Yes. Either way, man, this shit is pretty damn fun. And in lieu of proper raids or anything like that, this is a damn good consolation prize. And just reinforces how addictive gambling in a video game can be. If I didn't have a newborn son to consider, my second job, or a dwindling social life to worry about, well, I'd spend a whole lot of time in this mode, let me tell you.
overall, I think Tiny Tina's Wonderland is a pretty damn decent game if you're looking for that next time sink. It's not going to do anything incredibly new when it comes to breaking the Borderlands mold. In fact, I don't think any Borderlands game's ever going to do that. I think it changes enough stuff so that it doesn't feel like it's just a reskin of Borderlands 3. And if all you wanted is another game that has a bazillion guns, some funny side missions, and replayable endgame content for you to get through, well, then you're definitely going to get your money's worth. The whole timed Epic Game Store exclusive thing I think is definitely going to hurt it on the PC. And I think people who ignore it because of that are going to be missing out on a fun little looter shooter. And any shooter that lets you have your very own murderous farting mushroom is hard to pass on. 